My name is Cornelia Riele. I work for the Academy of European Laws, European Criminal Law section. And today, together with you, we would like to look at the judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union in criminal proceedings against Hans Ackerberg Franzen. This judgment of the court was given on 26 February 2013. In this case, the court decided on a reference for preliminary ruling by a Swedish national court. The facts of the case, in a nutshell, entailed that the criminal proceedings for tax evasion against Mr. Ackerberg Franzen have started after he had received and paid an administrative fine to the Swedish tax authorities for incorrectly reporting his income. In summary, the case revolved around two legal aspects. First, whether the case fell within the scope of EU law, namely under Article 51 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And second, whether the principle of nebis in idem prevents the imposition of criminal sanctions for tax evasion if administrative sanctions have already been imposed for the same act. In answer to this question, the court ruled that to fulfill the requirement of Article 51 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, asking for national legislation to be adopted for the implementation of EU law, it is sufficient that the situation as such falls within the scope of EU law. And furthermore, the court decided that an administrative fine would only be an obstacle to further criminal proceedings if the fine itself was criminal in nature. So we would like to now look at the impact of this judgment on the development of European criminal justice. And for this, I would like to warmly welcome Assistant Professor at the University of Bologna, Mrs. Giulia Lassani. Professor Lassani, which progress has been made with regard to the principle of Liebes in Idem in the case Ackerberg Franzen in 2013, th 10 years after the case of Göstürk and Brügge of 2003? Thank you very much, Connie. And first of all, thank you a lot for uh, having involved me in this project and coming straight forward to your question, to this first question. I think there is um, a big, uh, important change in Franson compared to the previous case law that you mentioned. That is essentially the fact that with Franson, the application of the scope of the Bicinidum starts to be extended also not just to the, the, the criminal matter as such, but also to the punitive matter. Um, in the other case law, uh, A, it was a case law referring to a pre-Lisbon situation, while Franson is related to a situation in which the Charter of Fundamental Rights is already in place, and therefore there is direct reference to Article 50 of the Charter, which provides for the principle of Nebisinidum. And on the other side, uh, B, the um, Franson case starts to recognize the application of this principle also to the so-called punitive matter, that is that part of administrative um, sanctions or disciplinary sanctions, which are recognized a, um, a uh, punitive, quasi-criminal nature by the court in Strasbourg first, and with Franson a bit before also in Bonda case of 2012, but in Franson the, uh, the court of justice starts to um, uh, expand and adopt this notion also for what concerns EU law, and that makes a, a big step forward in the interpretation of this principle. How big is the impact of the ruling with regard to the point that national offences against national tax law also constitute offences against EU law? I think this uh, case had a big impact on, on defining the scope of application of the Charter through the very controversial issue of whether VAT uh, frauds are falling within the scope uh, and, and are directly affecting the budget of the European Union or not. And let's say this is a case uh, which started to build up a uh, jurisprudence of the Court of Justice that later on uh, continued also, let's say, for instance, with the case uh, Tariq of 2015, in which the court um, opted for a relatively broad interpretation of the clause containing the charter, defining the scope of application of the charter itself. And uh, in this matter, which is very delicate because it concerns uh, state sovereignty to a, a greater extent, being tax law referred. Um, and it is a matter in which we have a directive, Directive 2006 of 2006, 111, but at the same time, a directive that does not cover 
also uh, the part that is strictly related to the Franson case, that is the sanctioning case of violations of VAT uh, obligations. And with this case, the court decided to recognize the application of the European Union law and the four of the charter and the four in the specific case also of the Nebisinidum principle uh, in a situation in which there was a piece of secondary legislation, a directive, but that wasn't covering exactly all the, um, the, 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 the points that were covered by the case. And in doing so, the, the court was making reference and making use of a broader interpretation of Article 325 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, according to which um, uh, breaches of the financial interest of the European Union uh, should be punished in an effective, dissuasive, and proportionate manner. And therefore, through this broad clause or broader interpretation of the clause, the court um, basically uh, expanded or interpreted in, in a broader way, let's say, the scope of application of the charter. And we see that in this in this uh, regard, the, the interpretation of the court also after Franson has been to a certain extent a bit undulatory uh, because in some cases then afterwards the court continued on the same line for instance in privacy cases let's say for instance tele2 watson uh, but in other cases concerning other subject matter uh, like in siracusa or in milev about the presumption of innocence the court however adopted a more restrictive approach to, so franson in this case was very important through the vat the controversial vat issue to extend uh, the scope of application of the charter but this is not a completely uncontroversial issue as of, as of today concerning the combination of tax penalties and criminal proceedings which effect have Ackerberg Franzen had in Sweden as well as in other EU member states? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this question, it is of course difficult to answer now, thinking only at Franzen, considering all that happened after Franzen, that of, of course influences very much uh, what is the current situation also in, in how to deal with the combination of tax penalties and criminal proceedings at the national and at the European level. And let's say the for my answer, perhaps it's a bit influenced on uh, the, the following case law, both of the court in Strasbourg and of the same court of justice on the same matter. But let's say from this ex post perspective, what we can see it is to a certain extent a um, double standard to a certain extent that was included in the France on decision. On one side, the court has affirmed very uh, firmly that a combination of administrative sanctions and criminal proceeding sanctions uh, is allowed only if the administrative sanction does not amount to a punitive one. So in this sense, the court seemed to be more aligned to the case law that at the time was a landmark decision of the court in Strasbourg, like Zolotukin, in which there was this um, more uh, straightforward application of the Nebisinidum principle. At the same time, however, in the same decision, Franson, the court already uh, seems to introduce some flexibility going a bit towards the um, difficulties that were raised by member states, saying that, however, A, it is for the national judge to assess whether a certain uh, administrative sanction is of criminal nature, punitive nature or not, and B, also, it has to be assessed whether the final combination of the sanctions can be considered proportionate as such, and in this sense, whether the combination, although refer to the, the, the punitive matter, it is nonetheless acceptable in light of the principle of proportionality. And in this sense, Franson, seen now, uh, looking at all what that happened afterwards, can be seen as an anticipation of what will become then a real trend in the in the case, in the European case law concerning the Bicinidum that is a very much focus on the proportionality of the final sanction. So I'm not sure that this was the main point at the time when Franson was issued, but uh, looking at it back now, it is one of the main anticipation, let's say, that can be found in this case. Well, thank you very much. When we now look at the fourth question, I wonder, are there any problems left today, practical or theoretical, on the implementation of Nevis in Edem in such procedures that may combine penalties of an administrative nature and proceedings? Well, I would say yes, there is many problems. There are many problems. I have to say, I don't believe that most problems are... Um, 
uh, can be, let's say, attributed to Franzen as, set, as such as a case, but again, it is the result of all the case law that followed also Franzen and also of the overruling of the court in Strasbourg uh, with A and B versus Norway and all that followed. So I would answer to this question, let's say pointing out three main critical problems that, however, uh, uh, let's say, are the result of how the case law on the matter uh, developed in the course of the time. First critical issue that I think is still uh, unresolved, more theoretical level, but then has also very practical implication is at the, the current state is the uh, principle of Nebisinidem still covering also the procedural uh, profile of, of this, of this uh, right, meaning is it still prohibited to carry out multiple proceedings or the Nebisinidem has been de facto, if, even if not formally, but reduced just to a final assessment of proportionality of sanctions, therefore only reduced to its more substantial dimension. This is a problem that remains open and that is particularly uh, clear, I would say, both in light of the case law of the, of the court in Strasbourg and of the case law more recent of the Court of Justice in Menchi, Garson, Di Pumazeka, all these cases from 2018. Um, a second critical issue that remains open, um, which seems to stem from the latest case law of the Court of, uh, of Justice, is perhaps whether it is relevant which proceeding uh, is terminated first in determining potential violations of the Bicinidum. Uh, this is not clearly addressed by the court, but for instance, we can see that in Garlson, one of the 2018 cases decided by the Court of Justice, um, the court seemed to have found a violation of the Nebisinidum principle after a criminal sanction had been applied, had been uh, imposed, although this decision, this sanction was not even enforced because in the case specifically there was a pardon. So this also remains an open issue. Is the court now uh, recognizing a certain implicit relevance of which proceeding terminates first? And this is relevant because before this overruling, still at the time of Franzen, there was the rule of um, first come, first serve that was emerging from the case law of the court in Strasbourg. Now this rule is not working any longer. However, is it still working in one direction in case the, the criminal proceeding is the one that terminates first? It, this remains to be assessed. And a last uh, issue that is critical, I mean, last just to be synthetic, but of course there's many critical issues, concern for, uh, concerns uh, the, uh, problem of legal certainty. This is both theoretical but also very practical issue in light of how the case law of the European courts developed uh, concerning the Bicinidum, it is very difficult to know ex ante whether a certain combination of sanctions will be considered to be in compliance with the principle or not. And this, of course, has um, a lot of concrete implications because parties, national authorities, state member states are put in a difficult position of trying to understand whether their um, um, punitive sanctioning mechanisms are going to generate violation of this right or not. And this, uh, of course, brings back the issue that was emerging very much uh, in very explicit way in the, with regard to the case law of the Strasbourg court, whether the Nebisinidem can still be considered a right or whether this pressure on the Bicinidum to become the solution to all problems in a system which is very much transnational, but then doesn't have harmonization, for instance, of the punitive mechanisms or doesn't have um, a common regulation of to which extent administrative authorities can exercise punitive powers of not, uh, is de facto making the Nebisinidum principle um, a rule to regulate powers rather than an individual right as we were more uh, traditionally uh, trying to consider it. Are there any problems left today, practically or theoretical, within the implementation of Nebis in Edom in such procedures that combine penalty, penalties of administrative nature and criminal proceedings? Thank you. Um, I think it is difficult to provide a comprehensive answer to this question because national systems, of course, are very different from each other and where 
uh, even more different at the time when Franzon was issued and even before when there was even uh, fewer, uh, a lower level of harmonization between member states than there is today. But uh, I guess what could be said is that um, the, there was a general situation of uncertainty on how to deal with this combination of potentially punitive administrative sanction and criminal sanctions, how to uh, deal with double track systems. And this was a time in which um, the, the leading case law of the court in Strasbourg, Zolotukin, was very much pushing towards a system uh, in which the first sanction uh, that was imposed was basically banning the others from, from being enforced. And therefore, this was a time in which at the national level there was much uh, trying to adapt national systems to avoid conviction from the court in Strasbourg. Uh, we have cases like Menarini, like Dubu, and then just after Franson, like Grande Stevens, cases in which the national administrative authorities uh, that have um, punitive powers, uh, for instance, in banking supervision, for instance, in, in antitrust, in, in uh, market financial regulation, had started to review their internal mechanisms of sanction in trying to, um, to, to, to align it with the, the, the principle that were emerging with the, uh, by, the, by the court in Strasbourg. And therefore, I think it was a time in which it, there was still quite some uncertainty to which extent all these um, principles could find an application also within the frame of, of the European Union. And in this sense, we see a, a path uh, that starts with Franson, that starts to recognize this idea of punitive in, in a very specific field that is tax law, which is very sensitive, and then a continuation of this, of this um, jurisprudence in, in the 2018 cases, Menci, Garson, and Ipuma Zecca, facing the uh, the problem of what happens uh, when it is uh, a matter that is regulated by the European Union, also when it comes to sanctioning contrary to the tax matter. So we see a progressive uh, application of this principle and a progressive struggling of the national authorities to understand first what is exactly that the European courts are indicating, and in this sense, the overruling of the court in Strasbourg didn't help much, and then also to adapt the national system to this uh, new interpretation of the Nebisinidum principle. Before the ruling of the court in Ackerberg, Franzen, how have the national legal systems dealt with similar cases? And finally, which effects has Ackerberg, Franzen had on, for the protection of the European Union's financial interests on a national as well as on a union-wide level? Thank you very much for your time. Well, I think this case clearly shows um, the, the the importance that the uh, that a stable let's say uh, interpretation by the court of justice can have also in pushing the debate at the legislative level first of all at the European Union uh, in the European Union uh, from the um, statements of the court concerning VAT frauds in France but also then in Tarico case. Um, it developed also and it supported the, the debate at the legislative level when it came to the approval of the directive pro for the protection of the financial interest of the European Union and also afterwards for the approval of the regulation of the, the powers of the European Public Prosecutor Office. So, and in both, in both negotiations, the issue of VAT uh, frauds was very much a key issue in, let's say, impeding also smooth uh, approval of, of the directive and therefore also of the regulation, among other uh, complicated issues. So therefore, I think this case um, started to highlight how much the financial matter, uh, the tax, but also the financial matter is important for the development of the uh, policy of the European Union and therefore also has an influence on the policy and, and the legislation of the national uh, states to um, develop the integration of criminal of the criminal law system at the European Union level. I think um, the, the financial matter uh, and Franson is a clear case, clear example of, of this in the sense um, has proven and continues to prove really the towing uh, tool towards which that that allows to um, to um, make uh, and increase 
the 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 competence to a certain extent or to use fully the competence that are, is already recognized by the treaties by the European Union developing uh, a more integrated system of criminal law and therefore also the, the criminal the, the the European Public Prosecutor Office which has an important though limited competence also when it comes to VAT frauds um, shows how it is first the financial matter that starts to be the most integrated part of European Union criminal law and then other follows. Now we are debating about extending the competence of the EPPO, but again it is from the financial interest also in the criminal matter that the integration of European criminal law has been developing and I believe is still developing. <laughs> 